Hello and welcome to a revision session looking at Russian history, in particular agricultural and developments and collectivization in 1929-41 in Russia. The main question we'll be focusing on today is this one here. Was collectivization in the USSR in the years 1929-41 almost solely an ideological success? What's the validity of this view? Collectivization was, of course, in some ways an ideological success, but we'll be looking at how actually it was more of a political success than an ideological one, and certainly an economic and social failure. So let's start by looking at why collectivization was um, only an ideological success to a, to a certain extent. Well, as Orlando Fijas has highlighted himself, one of the driving forces behind the move to collectivization was ideology. Um, Stalin believed that peasants were too imbued with private property, despite the existence of some communes, and he wanted to force people into um, a more socialist um, ideology. So uh, he was successful in this by 1941, around 98 to 100 percent, depending on the figures that you look at, of farms uh, moved from being family owned private farms to sovkhoz or kolkhoz, um, so state owned or communally owned uh, farms, uh, farms of a greater economy. And this was a move, therefore, away from capitalism, those privately owned farms, and towards socialism and communism, with those collectively owned uh, things there, the collectively run economy. In this way, it was an ideological success. Uh, it was essential that they needed to move away from the very uh, capitalist NEP um, towards a, a new um, economic plan, although obviously not to the NEP. Um, Additionally, it was an ideological success in a way, although not ethically, um, because of the destruction of the kulaks. Um, so kulaks were the better off peasants, um, those who perhaps owned more of their own land, more of their own um, animals and goods and things. Um, and as such, they were seen as a class. Um, and this class was abolished. Um, as part of the collectivization process, um, and we'll talk more about that later on. But around two million were exiled, and it's estimated that perhaps around twenty thousand or so were killed uh, as part of um, a process sometimes called the Red Holocaust. In this way, the destruction of this class, and therefore a move towards kind of evening out everyone on even keel as a peasant. Um, was in a way an ideological success and a move towards the Stalin's socialism um, that he was aiming for. There were, however, some limitations to the success um, or ideological success of collectivization. Um, in particular, the two things um, that I would note would be uh, one that Rowan and Wallers have pointed out. Uh, peasants on collectivized farms still were illegally initially farming private plots, so very small areas of land, um, but they were privately uh, looking after those tiny little bits of land and trying to sell on the black market initially um, the goods that they had on these private plots, and they were possibly putting more energy into doing that than they were um, farming the collective land, because on the collective farms uh, they were only being given well, minimal amounts of money for the large amounts of produce that the government was taking away from them, whereas on private plots they could sell the goods or keep the goods for themselves. Um, and as such, it, it was in this way a little bit of a failure because even Stalin himself realised by 1935 that he needed to decriminalise these use of private plots and they called them collective farm markets. Um, he legalised them. And some people like Rowan Waller have said that this is almost a neo-NEP, a move back towards capitalism. However, it was obviously much, much more limited than the NEP had been. It was tiny elements of the whole uh, country's economy being allowed to have uh, these tiny private plots 
um, to produce goods. Um, on these private plots, so around 52% of vegetables and 70% of the meat and milk produce were being produced in the 1930s in the USSR. So in this way, I'd say it definitely was a limitation and collective farm markets were a limitation on the success ideologically of collectivisation. This is that element of capitalism remaining behind. Additionally, another limitation of the ideological success would have to be um, the, the feeling of peasants, in particular in rural areas as a result of the famines in 1932 and 1933. Um, many of them were feeling like they'd been let down by the government, that they weren't necessarily supportive of collectivisation. And even before the famines, um, it's certain that many peasants only really accepted um, collectivization not because they accepted the ideology and that they bought into the ideology but because of um, fear of the 25,000ers of the OGPU um, who were scaring them into accepting collectivization um, so for example they'd seen the OGPU and the 25,000ers um, arresting or deporting anyone who was seen to be a kulak um, and eyewitnesses describe the use of guns, for example, uh, when the 25,000ers would turn up or the OGPU would turn up to farms, perhaps that were privately owned, and ask everyone there at gunpoint, uh, is there anyone who would object to this being a collectivised or state-owned farm? And obviously no one would object because they're at gunpoint and they would therefore say that unanimously the peasants had decided um, to support collectivisation. But in fact, ideologically, they weren't buying into the idea and therefore there's always that potential for um, uprisings. It's only terror and fear uh, that are keeping them uh, in their place. And we can see that because around one in three uh, peasants who were on these collectivised farms actually fled the farms uh, to go to the towns. So they clearly weren't completely won over ideologically by the idea of collectivisation. So certainly there were some ideological successes. Um, there was a definite move away from the capitalism of the NEP um, and towards almost all farms being collectively owned. Um, however, there were some some limitations in the form of the miniature um, kind of neo-NEP um, and um, peasants not being completely won over by the idea. So why then do we think that collectivisation was more of a political success. Well, Fiji's, um, Orlando Fiji's has argued that the other driving factor behind collectivisation was that uh, desire that to control peasants. It was a power struggle. Um, for example, peasants previously could hold the state to ransom by withholding grain. Uh, there was a mistrust of the peasantry that drove collectivisation, he says. Um, additionally, there's the desire for Stalin to be making sure that he is breaking away from others in the party and controlling others in the party. So both of these things were things that um, were aims of collectivisation. So starting with looking at um, the desire to control the peasants themselves. Um, in terms of the peasants and controlling them, um, it was a great political success, collectivisation. Um, 95, 96, 97% of available farmable land was collectivised, whether it was popular or not. Um, and in this way, the peasants were unable to withhold grain anymore because if it was state-owned or collectively owned, uh, then the grain was being taken away from them, whether they liked it or not. Um, and we also see this um, with the process of kulakization also known as the Red Holocaust, um, as de uh, deemed by uh, Jenkins. Um, through this use of terror, kulakization, trying to sort of capture any peasants and uh, exile them or kill them, um, it was terrorising people into accepting collectivization. They didn't want to be seen as the people who were withholding grain. Uh, who Kulak literally means uh, kind of like a fist or to grab something. So they didn't want to be seen as Kulaks uh, withholding grain or having more produce or goods or animals than anyone else. And, then, and through that kind of terror of being labelled a Kulak or kind of ending up with their fate, um, peasants did... Um, accept collectivisation, even if it was reluctantly. 
Um, additionally, if we're talking about this scapegoating, the kulakization and peasants, although it's true that um, there was some deliberate destruction of crops and animals to avoid kulakization, um, the majority of peasants uh, were kind of being controlled uh, in this way. The second thing we mentioned in terms of uh, consolidation of power or political success of collectivization uh, was Stalin himself uh, within the party um, and his political success within the party. Um, it's been noted that uh, by Rowan Waller that one of the other main aims that Stalin had was in fact to pick, pick a political fight with um, Bukharin, who was one of his main opponents at the time in the 1930s. Um, and Bukharin had said that prices should uh, increase to encourage peasants to increase their output that they were making. That If they're earning more money per good, then they're going to create more goods. But Stalin uh, wanted to break away from Bukharin, and therefore he um, was pursuing a policy of collectivization, whereby whether the peasants liked it or not, they were going to be forced to produce more goods for the state. Um, and in this way, although his policies were very unpopular, he was successful. Um, he did manage to enforce collectivization through the use of um, the kind of the police force, the 25,000s, etc. Um, and Bukharin lost power and eventually was executed after a show trial in 1938. Uh, so also in this way, um, he was quite successful politically. Um, and additionally, I think in terms of comparing the success politically to the success ideologically, we can see that he was more interested in the political success um, than the, the ideological success of collectivization. Um, in the events of March 1930, um, so shortly after collectivization started, um, there was quite a drive towards terror to make sure that um, all peasants were joining collectivized farms and that kind of thing. Um, and in Pravda, the kind of communist newspaper, um, Le uh, Stalin wrote that um, he wanted to kind of criticize the local people who were being overzealous and he called them dizzy with success. And he said those people who were blundering around and um, using terror to force peasants to join communes were dizzy with success. And in, in this way, um, many people read this to mean that he didn't necessarily agree with them forcing peasants to join these communes or the collective farms. Um, and overnight almost, um, in the kind of three-month period from March 1930 when he said it, it went from 55% um, of peasants uh, in rural areas being part of collectivised farms to only 23%. Um, so there's a significant decrease in uh, collectivization success um, as a result of his comments. And we can only read into this that um, Stalin was... Um, he was emphasising the importance of his political success. He didn't want to be um, unpopular and cause discontent um, to such an extent um, at the cost of his political success. He wanted to make sure that he was accepted. So he's scapegoating not only the Kulaks, um, but he's also scapegoating other members of the party or uh, those, of him, those people who are helping him to enforce collectivization in order to ensure that he, above ideological success, remains politically powerful and successful and prevents there being uprisings. This being said, it is still worth noting that several months later he did revert the policy back to forced collectivisation. Finally, um, although slightly more controversially, uh, historian Robert Conquest has suggested that the process of kulakization and even uh, the government's response to the Ukraine famine uh, as part of collectivization were actually um, politically motivated rather than ideologically um, motivated. So they were using kulakization as a war on remaining nationalist elements, so perhaps areas or individuals who they saw as a nationalist threat um, politic or a political threat um, they could deem them kulaks and, and get rid of them in exile um, or, or through execution. 
um, and with the Ukraine family, Ukraine was an area of particular opposition to collectivisation um, and to some of the um, political ideas um, that the Communist Party were putting forward and um, through co using collectivisation almost as an excuse for um, what was happening in Ukraine and the famine occurring in Ukraine, they were able to uh, quell rebellion there or kind of stop the spread of discontent there because, well, ultimately the people there were dying. And so ultimately, um, although ethically questionable, it's definitely true that collectivisation was a great political success for Stalin. Um, he was able to scapegoat his enemies, uh, such as Bukharin, um, and through scapegoating the Kulaks, he was able to control the peasants, um, and also um, not only kind of uh, that, but he was able to uh, quell rebellion in other areas of the country, such as Ukraine, um, as well through the policy of collectivisation. So let's return to our main question. Collectivisation in the USSR, um, was it almost solely an old uh, ideological success? Well, in this way, I'd argue it's not solely an ideological success. It's actually more of a political success and, a, uh, and to a great extent, um, although limited to, in some ways, an ideological success. Um, it certainly was an economic and social failure. So let's have a look at these two elements in a little more detail. So why was a collectivisation um, so much of an economic failure? Well, the first thing to say is it wasn't completely and totally an economic failure. Uh, there were some minor elements of success, mainly in the cities. So collectivisation led to an increase in urbanisation, um, more individuals moving towards the cities. So it's estimated around one in three of those uh, peasants in the forced uh, collectivised farms or state-owned um, farms uh, moved or ran away to the cities. And um, the population in, in kind of the late 20s, early 30s, is uh, estimated to have been increasing at around uh, 50,000 peasants per week at one point. Um, and this increased urbanisation led to uh, cheap labour, Although many of the peasants that were moving into the cities in those numbers had very little education, it was cheap manual labour uh, which could be used in the factories. And in that way it was quite good for the economy. Additionally, it's been argued that um, the collectivisation did lead to the development of more new machinery. Um, the machine tractor stations were set up in the countryside um, and... Um, also there was uh, investment in more machinery and this was because um, through a focus on collectivisation um, Russia or the, sorry, the USSR was able to produce more uh, agricultural goods itself so it was less reliant on uh, importing these goods from other countries which meant that they could then in turn invest the money that they might have spent on those agricultural goods from other countries, on machinery from other countries. And that helped start off the process of industrialisation, although on a limited scale. So in some ways it had been a success. Additionally, it's, it's true that um, in terms of percentage of the country that was um, collectivised, 77% um, of the country that... Uh, could be used for growing crops was collectivised by 1932 and by 1935 94% of the area that crops could be grown on was collectivised. So in this way they were collectivising um, the right areas and they were producing as many goods as they could through the collectivisation process. However there were major problems economically with collectivisation. Um, in particular, one of the problems faced was in rural areas. So although in cities there were some kind of improvements, in rural areas there were major issues. Um, the loss of the kulaks through uh, kulakization actually meant the loss of the most skilled farmers and therefore led to a fall in production. Um, also, fear of being labelled a kulak led to uh, the deliberate destruction of crops and animals 
um, in many areas of the countryside and it's estimated that around 25% of cattle, pigs and sheep were actually being disposed of or got rid of um, either through kind of furious feasting before um, being found out um, or through burning or disposing in other ways without sharing with the whole country. So it's a quarter of cattle, pigs and sheep being killed or destroyed um, rather than shared um, in order to avoid being labelled a kulak. So a complete waste and perhaps something that maybe could have helped to prevent uh, the famines that occurred later. Additionally, although it's true that there were some minor steps towards industrialisation through the machine tractor stations being set up, in reality, uh, only one in 40 farms actually had access to these. And although uh, by 1938, 72% of ploughing was done uh, using tractors and 57% and of sowing seeds was also done using machine tractors, um, actually, in reality, many of the work remained um, hand labour. So, for example, although tractors could help to cut grain, um, it had to be hand tied afterwards. So it was a slow move towards industrialisation. And additionally, it's also worth noting that, of course, the Sovkhoz, the post of the Kolkhoz, so the um, state-owned rather than communally-owned farms, always had better access to the machinery uh, than the communally-owned ones. Additionally, it's definitely worth noting that there were major issues with production following collectivisation. One of the reasons for this, Rowan Waller have um, highlighted, is that collectives were poorly organised and the party activists who helped establish them knew nothing of farming. So many of the high up individuals within the party actually had no knowledge of farming and that wasn't very helpful for trying to um, review and reform agriculture. Um, not only this, but we can see from this table here from Evans and Jenkins' book um, that the production of things like grain and cattle and also pigs and sheep as well um, actually fell as a result of um, collectivisation rather than growing. So, for example, in 1928, um, you can see that uh, 73 million tonnes um, of grain were being produced in, in the USSR and uh, 70.5 million uh, heads of cattle were being produced. Uh, but a few years into collectivisation in 1931, these actually have dropped grain, perhaps not so much, to 69.5%, but cattle significantly to 52.5%, uh, sorry, not percent, to 69 ton, million tonnes, and cattle to 52.5 um, head of, million head of cattle uh, a year. So that's actually a significant drop. And one of the reasons for this, and you can see it continuing there, although grain actually eventually rose again, uh, cattle and pigs and sheep um, still remained relatively low into 1935. And the reason for this was, um, although collectivisation meant the forced sharing of goods uh, with the people in the cities, not just the people in the countryside having access to those food uh, groups, um, it wasn't good for encouraging peasants to produce as much food as possible because high quotas of what they produced were being forcibly taken by the government. Um, there wasn't much reason for them to try and produce large quantities um, of grain or cattle or sheep or whatever it happened to be because the government was forcibly taking them the, the produce at a very low price. So why bother slaving over trying to create more than um, the quota that you've been given? So they may be, say for example, or this is oversimplified, asked to produce 10 cattle uh, from a particular farm um, as their quota. Um, and perhaps as a farm they, they need only one, um, one cow for themselves. Um, why would that particular farm have any reason to produce more than that 11 cattle that they needed to? Um, they're going to just produce what they need to because if they produce 12, uh, 12 cows or 12 cattle um, then the state's probably going to take 11 of those and they'll keep the one that they need. 
um, and that extra cow they're not going to be given very much money for because the government's uh, requisitioning the goods at very low prices. So what it actually led to was a drop in the amount of food being produced because um, it almost fell into a subsistence agriculture. People were just producing uh, the amount that they were being asked to and no more. Um, so in this way, it was definitely an economic failure. And it wasn't just an economic failure, it was a social failure as well. Although it's true that the population of the cities was increasing, um, so as we said earlier, uh, 1928 to 32, this was a rate of around 50,000 people per week moving into the cities. Um, and by 1939, it's estimated that around 19 million extra people were living in um, urban areas and rural areas than they had done before. This was largely um, huge groups of people who had a sense of betrayal by the regime. Uh, they had, had their jobs replaced by machines or they'd run away from collective farms uh, to end up in those, in, in those cities. So in that way, I don't think it was a social success. Uh, just because they'd moved into the cities. And additionally, uh, in rural areas, socially, it was pretty much a disaster, uh, mainly because of the widespread famines that spread in 1932 to 33. Estimations vary from around 5 to 8.5 million uh, people dying of famine, um, starvation and disease as a result of collectivisation. Uh, the lack of foods in certain areas and the uh, quotas being demanded by the government remaining uh, very high uh, led to huge numbers of deaths um, in rural areas in those years. Uh, partly because of poor harvests, but also because um, of that subsistence agriculture, the wasting of many seeds and crops um, that we mentioned earlier. Um, and additionally, um, in rural areas, uh, it was a social failure because... Um, of unrest um, increasing. This was being dealt with very brutally. Um, so, for example, villages were sometimes being burnt down or people were being sent to labour camps um, as well. And, of course, uh, there's the question over whether or not there was even perhaps uh, an attempt at a genocide. Um, this is questionable. Um, whether Robert Conquest is right to suggest... Um, that the um, deliberate containment of the people of Ukraine amounts to um, a deliberate attempt to, to kill the people who had been rebelling against uh, some Russian policies um, or not. It's certainly true that the government could have released more grain reserves and didn't. And if they had re re released more grain reserves, then um, certainly less people would have died of famine in the years 1922, uh, 1932 and 33. Um, Orlando Fiedges has argued that actually there's not enough evidence to suggest that there really was genocide as a policy. There's no written documents to suggest that way. But certainly um, the numbers of people dying are um, just highlighting the fact that um, it was political policy and ideology above um, social um, d factors driving uh, the policy of collectivisation. And in this way, um, it's certainly true that, um, if returning to our question, collectivisation um, was more of an ideological success than an economic and social one, but overall uh, more of a political success than an ideological one, as it seemed to be more about Stalin um, breaking away from um, other members of uh, the, the party um, and uh, ensuring power over the peasants um, than solely um, ideologically moving towards socialism. We're coming to an end of this session revising agricultural developments and collectivization in Russia, 1929-41. to 41. But what I want you to consider... Um, as we end this session, is how you could perhaps rework this evidence and information in a slightly different form with a different exam-style question. Why not have a go at one of these exam-style questions? To what extent was the main aim of collectivization consolidating control over the peasants?
or collectivization in the USSR was a carefully planned policy controlled by Stalin, assess the validity of this view. Good luck with your revision.